Good evening, everyone. How are you? It's a whole call and response thing that I got used to. Um, I'm Dennis Williams on the board here of the Center for Fiction. Um, before we go any further, I just want to give a round of applause to the staff here at the Center for Fiction. Every day, they do an amazing job keeping this place going, but especially tonight, putting all the logistics together for this event. So if you wouldn't mind, just a quick round of applause. Great. Awesome. And um, I'd be remiss, and uh, maybe on a little bit more of a somber note, if we didn't acknowledge the sort of terrible tragedy that happened not that far from here. I actually live just across the street, and so knowing that the 35th uh, train station stop is just one stop from uh, Atlantic Terminal just kind of creeped me out this morning. So um, my thoughts are sort of with the folks who were terrorized and traumatized this morning. Like, no one should have to deal with that. So uh, if you're connected to that in any way, uh, you have uh, lots of positive energy heading your way. <clears throat> All right. Um, I hate when people read notes from these devices, but it's the only thing I have. So I'm going to have to read from this device. Um, tonight, we are incredibly honored to welcome acclaimed writer and director James Lapine, whose recent book, Putting It Together, which immediately made the New York Times bestsellers list, chronicles the two-year odyssey of creating the iconic Broadway musical Sunday in the Park with George. That deserves a round of applause, because that was amazing. <clears throat> I'm just going to give you a little bit of of, of James's story here. Uh, on Broadway, he has collaborated with Stephen Sondheim, of course, writing the book and directing Into the Woods, uh, Passion, Sunday in the Park with George, of course, and the multimedia review uh, Sondheim on Sondheim, which we all know, in addition to a host of other beloved plays and musicals that he's collaborated with lots of really, really famous people uh, to do. So we're so honored to have you here. Thank you so much. And thank you in advance for being so gracious and sticking around and signing books for people. It, it means a lot. I have a lot of signed books on my bookshelf, and I like those the best. <laughs> um, later, uh, uh, James is going to be joined by Anna DeVere Smith. Uh, she's not here, but again, she is incredibly accomplished. She is on a bridge on her way here. I don't know if you tried moving through New York today. It's a little complicated, so we'll give her some grace. But um, if you don't know Anna, it's because you don't watch Blackish religiously like I do. Um, but Anna DeVere Smith is credited with creating a new form of theater. In this form, Anna conducted interviews and then performed the, in, the individual she interviewed verbatim in an effort to represent multiple points of view about controversial events. If you know anything about me, and you don't need to, uh, for many years I worked at HBO, and the uh, show that Anna did for us is one of my all-time favorites. So if you get a quick plug for my company, um, if you get a chance, watch that for sure. Her plays include Notes from the Field, that's on HBO, uh, Let Me Down Easy, House Arrest, Twilight Los Angeles, which was nominated for two Tony Awards, and Fires in the Mirror, which was runner-up for the Pulitzer Prize. Other theater honors include two Drama Desk Awards and two Obies. She's the recipient of the MacArthur Fellowship. That means people pay her a lot of money. Uh, in 2012, President Obama awarded her the National Endowment of the Humanities Medal. In May, she will receive the Medal for Spoken Language from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Uh, so when Anna gets here, we'll give her a warm round of applause. But James is going to start the evening off. Um, and I'm going to step away from this microphone. But thank you all for being here. Uh, enjoy the night. James, would you turn your mic on? We talked a little. Anna and I are working together on a project. And, oh, I turned my mic on, right? I don't change direction, I just give it. <laughs> okay, how's that? Can you hear me? Great. I was about to say, Anna and I are going to ask each other questions, and we are working on a project together, which has um, been very exciting, and we'll kind of tell you a little bit about that. Why don't I just start, um, Anna was going to say, James, wh why'd you write this book? <laughs> well, Anna, I think I'll tell the people now. OK. Um, I actually had socially met a, um, uh, a publisher who uh, I just knew socially. And he was asking me about my background. And um, uh, 
he said, you should write a memoir. And I said, uh-huh, and that was that. And then he came back to me later and said, you should write a memoir. And I didn't really want to write a memoir. But after a while, I started thinking about uh, writing about two years of my life. And that is when, from the date I met Stephen Sondheim uh, to the day we opened Sunday in the Park with George. So um, I kind of went back to him and said, I, I don't want to write a memoir, but I, I think this could be a really interesting book um, because I'd like to share um, how something gets made, how you make something, um, and how this got made because I think uh, it's a very personal experience to collaborate. It's almost like you're in a marriage and the transfer of ideas and how things become what they become, particularly when you're writing a musical that's not based on something. Most musicals you probably know are based on movies or books or whatever, and there are very few real original musicals of which this was. <clears throat> so what I went about doing was um, contacting every person I could find who was involved in that production and interviewing them. Um, as well as starting to sit down and write my own narrative about how I ended up in the theater. It was my first Broadway show, and I had only been doing theater actually for, oh, I don't know, maybe four years, three years. I started as a photographer and graphic designer, which is what I studied in graduate school, and um, by a complete fluke, um, I ended up uh, designing a magazine called Yale Theater for the Yale School of Drama because I happened to know a guy who I went to school with who was doing his graduate studies there. The dean of the school, uh, Robert Brewstein, uh, then hired me full time to come to the Yale School of Drama and teach a class in design to theater um, management students who were being trained to run theaters. Um, and Brewstein did this really strange, interesting thing, which was he, in the month of January, I think for two or three weeks, made everyone in the school, faculty as well as students, and I was teaching a course, do something other than what they normally do. So if you're an actor, you build a set. Uh, you know, if you're a set builder, you act. That that faculty would act. I think it was an excuse for a lot of the faculty to act. But um, <laughs> anyway, my my design students said, "Well, you should direct a play," because I was always telling them my interest in the theater was really through artistic venues and the downtown scene of Robert Wilson, Richard Foreman. I don't know if you know any of these people, but they were really the kind of far out uh, theater artists of of the day. So I said, well, if you want me to direct a book, you, <clears throat> excuse me, direct a, uh, something, you have to find me something to do, a book, a play, or something. And one of the guys came up with um, a play called Photograph. And I thought, well, hey, you know, I, that's a good title for me. And then I looked at it, it was by Gertrude Stein, who, um, and then I looked at it some more and I realized, well, it's really not a play, it's a poem. And then I looked at it even closer and I realized, oh, it's only three pages long <laughs> and five acts. So um, I thought I'd take my photography and, and get a gang of people together and we put this very kind of avant-garde, very arty-farty show together. And um, we put it on in a little theater in town in New Haven and um, my producer, who was really a stage manager, said, you should do this in New York. I said, sure, you know. So somehow she found this loft in Soho. And I'm telling you, we're talking, you know, Mickey and Judy putting on a show. We put signs around Soho, anybody want to be in a play? I'm not kidding. <laughs> and we had, like, you know, the guy who was a cashier at the health food store. And um, uh, I, 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 we needed money. Um, to put this on, and a friend of mine said, oh, I heard that Jasper Johns really loves Gertrude Stein. And I was a big Jasper Johns freak. And uh, we wrote him a letter, and he sent us uh, $2,500 through the um, uh, Foundation for Contemporary Art, I think he was on the board of. And another friend of mine said, what can I do? And I said, you know, we're so naive. I don't know how you get people to review things. 
So she picked up the phone and called the lead critic of the New York Times. She was a very persuasive young lady. And she got him to come down to see the show with his son. He, she brought his son, who was probably about 11 or 12, and he wrote a huge rave review <laughs> of this Gertrude Stein thing. And that's how I got in the theater. So uh, with absolutely no intention whatsoever. Um, Part of what's interesting about that is um, why would Stephen Sondheim want to work with me? Um, I, by the time I had met him, I had directed and written two plays um, and one musical I worked on with Bill Finn called March of the Falsettos. And um, I knew the irony was um, he had seen everything I had done and I had only seen one show of his which was Sweeney Todd. So um, when I met him, he, um, I wanted, uh, was through a Broadway producer, I was interested in doing um, uh, uh, a musical maybe about a cool million. And, um, and this producer said, why don't you ask Stephen Sondheim? He was just coming off a big flop called Merrily We Roll Along. And um, I said, do you mind if I call him? I said, I don't mind. And then Steve told him, oh, I know his stuff. I'd love to meet him. And uh, I went in to meet him on a Sunday. Uh, and you have to picture, I lived in a kind of rat-infested loft down in the financial district. And I don't come from money. My parents were not college educated. And I sort of knew of Stephen Sondheim having seen Sweeney Todd. But it was the first time I was in a fancy place in Manhattan. He lived in a townhouse and rang the bell. and. Uh, walked in and he said, uh, he pulled out a joint and just started smoking a joint. And I thought, okay, I can do that too. <laughs> we kind of uh, got stoned together and um, uh, just started talking. And that's how we met. And um, we followed up. He took, he, he reread, he said, I, I remember A Cool Million, I'll reread it. And he called back a week later and said, you know, it's like Candide. It's the Candide story. I already did Candide. Uh, but if you have any ideas, um, you know, let me know. And I said, well, let's get together and talk, see what interests you and interests me. And I, I, again, naively brought a bunch of images of uh, images, uh, paintings, photographs, um, advertisements, things. And we just, um, I know it sounds so crazy at my age now talking about this, but we put them on the floor. And we sat and, and we went through them one at a time and you know, kind of free associated or I free associated. And the last one I put out was this painting of Seurat's, which is, was absolutely my favorite painting. And we started talking about it, and I was kind of explaining why I really love this painting. And he was going, oh yeah, there's this, there's this, there's this, there's this. Um, and he said, oh, it looks like a stage set. And I said, yeah. And I said, but there's somebody missing. And he said, who? And I said, the artist. And that perked him up. And uh, that's how the ball got rolling uh, with Sunday in the Park with George. So um, that's um, <clears throat> the introduction. And um, we are going to open it to questions, so start thinking. Um, now, what would Anna ask me? Oh, um, well, I think what's interesting is why I'm here tonight, because <clears throat> it's a theoretically a nonfiction book. And here she is just in time. Yay. <laughs> No, 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 no. Can I give you a hug? How do you do as me? And that's totally. <laughs> Thank Hi. you. you um, have a seat. Thank you. Uh, you just asked me a question, which I answered <laughs> rather lengthily, waiting for you to okay. arrive. Yeah. Oh, good, good. I don't know. You, you don't know if you know, you asked me why I wrote a book. So that's why I was telling <laughs> you why I wrote the book. Um, so Anne is going to ask me questions. I'm going to ask her questions, but I'll let her get settled. and put a microphone on and um, we'll get in. I started getting... to think that this Uber driver was deliberately going the wrong way. It took so long. Yeah, it happens. It oh, happens. Yeah. Did you turn that on? Uh, it's not green yet. I know. It hit the little thing on top right there. Okay. There it yeah. is. Yeah. Hey. Okay. Hey. 
Okay. Sorry, everybody. So how was your ride? <laughs> <laughs> it was something. I mean, yeah. It was really something. Yeah, you're here. It's good. I like your shoes. Um, <laughs> when did we first meet? Do you, do you ever remember when we did literally met? I don't have to say I don't. I had a phone call with you. And I met you, maybe the first time I met you was um, at MoMA for the, the screening of the documentary about Sondheim. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I think that's the first time. Yeah. Well, yeah. I've seen per many of you. I don't know that I've seen everything of yours, but I certainly went back in the day and was um, dazzled. Um, how did you... I have... Uh, notes he doesn't you see I think that's great that you don't have any notes <laughs> well if we need them we'll go down and get those but I'm curious because um, we have certain things in common which we discovered very surprising yeah um, but I was explaining to them how I got into the theater um, you went from college to acting training right. in San Francisco what made you um, want to go beyond that and do the kind of, I would call it, investigative um, one-person shows that are so incredible that you created. What was the moment, the light bulb moment, when you said, I'm going to want to do this? There wasn't a light bulb moment. No. And um, I hope there was one for you. Did he tell you about his light bulb moment yet? No. Okay. Uh, I had no light bulb moment. It was a, uh, it's a, it was a long process. As my unofficial mentor, I called him my mentor, but he wasn't really the late Studs Terkel, who I got to know very ah. well over over time. Um, you know, s talks about. I asked him once, well, if there was a defining moment in American character, and he said there is no. Uh, defining moment. It's an accretion of moments that lead to where we are now, where trivia becomes news and mm. a more and more less and less concern about human beings. Um, so I think it was just a, you know, a lot of things coming to, you know, what I ended up doing. Yeah. Um, what about you? You were a photographer. No, I Have was you mentioned that to them. Yeah, I kind of gave them the quick two second roll up to that. But the thing about it, you know, so many actors and are waiting for the phone to ring to give them a job. Right. And I think what's interesting is also you're finding something interesting that you wanted to make for yourself to do. And nothing could be more challenging than to play all these different people that yeah. you play. Yeah. Um, that just kind of evolved or did you have... Um, an inspiration of other actors who did similar things? I can't think no, of No, I mean, you know, I think I've always been, I remember when we had lunch the first time, I said, I feel outside of all this, you know, and um, I was interested in language mm -hmm. and people and identity, and, uh, and that kind of led me to be, but I was always a little outside uh, and not really, um, I mean, I think of you as a real theater person. You may have started another way, but and mm. and I don't. It's not just because of your uh, accomplishments and the recognition that you've gotten, but um, you know, I'm I'm I, I I think I just came to the theater because it was a place I could try to answer some questions, but it wasn't because about yourself or oh about no, the just world? about human beings. I see. But not you know, I think like you really know how to make a show, right? I mean, I mean, how did you have the nerve to go to Sondheim? You know, you, you talk I, about... Because I was just telling him I didn't know the guy. I didn't know much. I'd only seen one of his shows. So I knew he was kind of... I, I only got intimidated when I walked into his house, which was really fancy. Yeah. You know, and then I thought I'm kind of out of my league here. But, um, no, I don't know. You know, I think we fall into things. And I think if you make yourself open to falling into things. For me, I felt, what do I have to lose? You know, I'll, I'll do this and then maybe I'll stop doing this and I'll do something else. Um, I don't know uh, why my particular gifts turned out to be accurate for this particular profession. Um, but I think 
probably both of us are very open to things. And That's right. Yeah. Do you think that has to do with, because we, did you say that we, and it turned out that we went to college within miles of yeah. each other at about the same time. My school, which was an all girls school, um, dated boys from your school. All boys school, yeah. All boys school. And, you know, uh, I think it's the era that we were there mm -hmm. in school that, um, the country really changed, and it, it's, you know, the year before I got to then called, re regret, regrettably, be, a women's school called Beaver College, they were still checking, <laughs> but the year before I arrived, they were still doing um, inspections of rooms. Make sure you're there at night. Well, no, to make sure you made your bed the right way. And by the time I left, I was a resident assistant, not only I was two, I didn't even, we didn't see even that, know that. That's yeah. another thing right there. It was a resident assistant. And, you know, boys, of course, were not allowed in the, above the first floor. And by, but by the time I left, I was a resident assistant. Not only were men allowed in the dorm, but as an RA, I was giving advice to the guys. They would come <laughs> in and, and tell me their issues and the problems. So it was uh, really a, like a, yeah. a revolution in the world, but also like, I think, just very tumultuous time. Yeah. Um. We'll get to that in a minute, given yeah. what we're talking about doing now. You know, I think apropos of what you said, I don't. I was not intimidated. I don't get intimidated really. about about Stephen Sondheim. About right? anything for whatever reason, I'm um, just uh, whatever. You know, I don't. Um, if the show hadn't worked out, I probably would not be sitting here tonight. You know, it just um, just happened to be lucky. But you enough. know, I wanted to ask you something about that because. Watching the CBS show, um, the, uh, have you all seen that? The CBS Sunday Morning? It's really great about, about his book, about this wonderful book, putting it together. And, uh, and then also the long review in the New York Times of the book, mm -hmm. you know, stresses all the catastrophic things that went down. Right. And so, like, you're sort of not being intimidated, as you say. It must have been a really great way for you to be able to get through all those catastrophes. But what, what, what was the behind the scenes, non-catastrophic stuff that pushed it forward? Well, I was in two worlds. I was in the world of Sondheim, which was just the two of us. And it was like having a relationship uh, when we met, when we started working together. And uh, I wrote the whole first act, and he didn't, the only thing he wrote were the first five opening chords. Um, and I just thought, oh, he's never going to write any music. And I had a, um, a, a small uh, kind of advance I got from Playwrights Horizons to write something. So I think, oh, they'll make this a play, you know. But, um, I, when you have a partner like that, I, it's really helpful, um, you know, because before that I had just written plays by myself and directed them, so I was really in. But what I was not prepared for was Broadway and the pressures of Broadway. And um, uh, I can't say that I, you know, I wasn't intimidated, but it doesn't mean I wasn't stressed to the max, you know, so. Um, and difficult people, I, I, that was my, not my, my gift at the time. Um, I really didn't know how to treat people. And so going back and doing this book and interviewing all these people who didn't like me and I didn't like them, that's an interesting thing to do. Think about going back, you know, 40, 50 years and sitting down with the person that made your life a misery. And it's great. It really was it, great. Was that therapeutic? Totally. And you know, when they tell me why they didn't like me, I go, yeah, I get it, you know? And I tell them why I didn't like them. <laughs> and some of them got it and some of them weren't interested. But do, you think, but do you think, James, if it hadn't been successful that people would be so candid? No, well, we wouldn't be writing a book if it hadn't been successful. Right, well, yeah. you could have been, you could have well, been. Well, you know, the thing is, everybody in it, in it or around it thought it was going to be a big flop because the audiences didn't like it when we were in previews and kept walking out and the word of mouth was terrible. Thank God there was no internet. Um, so, I, I don't blame an actor. I don't know if you've been in anything where, that was a bomb uh, as an actor. My own work. <laughs> uh, while you were doing it, did you know that it wasn't working? No, I had a, one, one, when I decided to use other actors for one of my shows, ah. uh, it really didn't work. And um, I could tell they were unhappy. 
which is a terrible feeling, you know. Were you directing it or was someone else? No, doing? somebody else directed yeah. it. Um, and that's an awful feeling. And, and you have that more than me because for the most part, it's just me. Right. Uh, and then last fall, Twilight had other actors, but that play already had been done and had yeah, its own it thing. Terrific. But a play I wrote called House Arrest um, was the first time I decided, other than the time I developed this way of working, which was in 1980, uh, or 81, where I walked up to people in the street of New York and said, you know, I know an actor who looks like you. If you give me an hour of your time, I'll invite you to see yourself perform. So the first one had 20 real people and 20 actors. And I only played one part, Julia, from J.C. Penney, where I was doing temp work. And, um, <laughs> But you know, and it worked. And somebody asked me, you know, how'd you know it worked? And I said, well, because everybody was happy. Like after it opened, you know, everybody was happy. The actors were happy. The real people were happy. And you know, with House Arrest, which was the next, not the next time I, well, it's the, the second next time I tried using actors doing what I do, they weren't, they weren't happy. Well, and that's you, very, I don't know how you do, how do you deal with an actor who's not happy? And I, as a, yeah, I can be unhappy as a playwright with a director I, or well, stuff like that. Well, now I just say you seem unhappy. You just say you seem unhappy. Yeah, and I go, no, no, I'm not happy. And I said, well, let's put it, let put it a different way. I find you, I'm unhappy because <laughs> of the you're way fun. you're behaving <laughs> and acting. So if you don't get happy, maybe you shouldn't be here. The hardest thing for directing is when pe actors don't get on with each other. That's really, you're really a shrink sometimes. How can you perceive that? Oh, it's not hard. It's not hard. <laughs> not hard. Um, and finally, I've, I've had to sit down with two actors in a four-actor play and say, you know, I can tell you don't get along with each other. And here's the deal. If you don't get along with each other, one of you has to go. Ooh, that's pretty blunt. They got along after that. <laughs> you know. But the opposite was flying o over sunset. I told you that one of the things I loved the most about it was the intimacy that there appeared to be mm. between folks in the cast. How do you do that? Well, um, you know, sometimes it's great being the writer director, sometimes it's not. But um, A, you're very careful about who you cast. I like to do a little homework on everybody I cast to make sure that they're, you know, what their worth that work ethic is and how they work is some way I want to work. And I think it's called trust. You know, when you can build trust between the people you work with and build trust so that the people who work with each other trust one another and the material and, and push the reception away, you know. I mean, it's hard, I'm sure, I'm not an actor, but I'm sure, you know, actors love to get laughs, they, you know. But, I, but if they are on stage with someone that they're, they're with each other in a team, then I think you're in very good hands with each other as well. But I don't know, you know, it's human behavior. You get, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And but also, you know, Bernadette Peters on the CBS, a good morning or Sunday morning, um, said that for her, one of the things that was the glue for the whole process is that you and and Sondheim right. were clear and seemed to be together. Right. That must be really important, right? Yeah. Be on the same page. Yeah. But like a good, good parents. Yeah. It, I mean, in that instance, the producers made Sondheim come into rehearsal one day. He came in and sat next to me, never came to rehearsal, because they thought Mandy Patinkin was taking over, that I, I wasn't handling him well, and he was taking over the rehearsal. And, I felt like I was, you know, 15 years old having dad come sit next to me, but um, I don't know, I just navigated it. Um, what you had with Bernadette on one hand was somebody who's been acting since she was four, I think, and had such confidence in what she was doing all the time that there was no manner of insecurity. And if she ever is insecure or unclear or anything, she asks you right then and there about it. And then you had Mandy Patinkin, who was um, on fire, but kind of the opposite, not consistent, never quite sure what he was going to do. And, um, and it, 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 the cast was, you know, kind of 
discombobulated, I think, and then they had an inexperienced director. Um, you can, you know, if you get the book, you, you'll read everybody's point of view on it. Um, but Sondheim and I were always solid, you know, and that's what mattered. And you have to remember he was coming off a big flop. That show huh. closed, Merrily We Roll, yeah. closed in two weeks' time. Wow. And, uh, you know, his shows really hadn't been, he wasn't the god. He was Betty certainly became... re revered, but he didn't have any kind of commercial or long-term success that he came to have. So um, it was an interesting experience. But as I said, um, I think no matter what you do, the book should, I, to go back to why I wrote it, when I decided I was going to work in the theater, I went out and bought books on directing, and they were useless. Huh. And what I really wanted to do was write a book that explained the theater to somebody who knew nothing about it and how things get made. And, um, and I've heard from people who aren't even that interested in the theater liking the book because it, it's process. Whatever you do, and you have to work with other people, whether you're in J.C. Penney, is that where you were? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're in a cast, you know? I mean, in a different kind of cast. Yeah. It's interesting. When did you decide to do kind of what you call verbatim? I mean, that you yeah. started interviewing people and then becoming those people yourself? Right. Yeah. When did that switch over? Well, that, I mean, that, you know, I, I you know, I always feel... You know, it really started with Shakespeare and this idea that you don't have to, um, that you just, you say the words, that you stay on top of the words. Right. And I just had a very bad reaction to the method, you know, mm -hmm. as a student. And uh, I just didn't enjoy that process, you know, um, or the way teachers treated us around that, this mm -hmm. idea of truth. What is truth, right? That we can be everybody in the world if we have it inside. And I don't think that's true. I mean, I think I'm me, and I can never be you. I don't even know if I could be the me who was yesterday, right? right. And so I really like this idea, at least the way we were taught. And I, I never did Shakespeare in my career, really. But just this idea that identity can be on those words. And so... I wanted to learn more about that and figure that out. And I thought, well, what if I study real people's speech? Will that, will I understand mm -hmm. it? And I met this linguist by complete happenstance. I don't even know her name at a party. And um, I told her that I was interested in that. And, and, she's, and I told her that I thought if I could interview people and maybe, you know, uh, would I be able to st study their language with their language become particularly interesting in any way that would reveal something about him. And she said, well, I'm going to give you three cent questions to ask people. And, and I wanted their language, to, the syntax of their language to change in my presence. And the questions were, have you ever come close to death? Have you ever been accused of something that you didn't do? And do you know the circumstances of your birth? So the first one of those plays that I made, the one with the 20 people, I would talk about whatever they wanted to talk about. Mm. Swimming lanes at the Y, being a hairdresser, Meredith Monk, we talked about New Mexico. And then in it, I would say, gee, I want to ask you these three, question, three questions. And lo and behold, they, their whole manner of speaking would change. And so that is what, what the whole process has been is, and you know, like today was a catastrophe trying to get here. You know, I'm interested in catastrophe because basically <laughs> catastrophe is 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 in those three questions somewhere, mm. right? And and I go to places where things have gone wrong, and I talk to people, and then they speak in very interesting ways that uh, can, if repeated exactly, give a semblance that at the very least it's not me, that it's something else. So that's. But really you're weird. so extraordinary when you take on these characters because you, one forgets it's you. It's. It's an incredible gift. But do you know what I wanted to say is here we are at the Center for Fiction. Right. And we're nonfiction, but we're not I fiction. think what's interesting is we sort of are fiction too. Because, In what way? well, like this book is full of interviews. You don't use the entire interviews, you shape the interview to be what you want it to be. Not really. I, I, the shaping is 
shaping is in how the whole play comes together, right? right? You like, can't, you so can't. all that, like 250 interviews for to do 90 minutes, right? But I'm, but the it's the interview itself where that's the most important thing is do can I get people to say something that will be a kind of architecture of language that goes straight through, you know, in old fashioned method they even talk about, like what's the through line of thought. Yeah. So if I get in and mess that up too much, um, I don't really have what I need. So it's really finding the people who, as I say, would scream it from a mountaintop and I happen to be walking by, and then trying to come away from the interview with this perfect thing that's perfect dramatic dialogue, perfect storytelling, mm -hmm. and perfectly full of emotion too. So it's, it's the excavation of getting that thing first and then coming and experimenting with it. But with you, the other ones. as you described, you don't get it right off the bat. You have, you have to go in and get it in a way. Well, we look, you just listen for it. Or you, you know. listen for you it. You must have something similar in terms of even directing, right? When you think you have something, that's the fact that you well, get yeah, to that, you get to direct what you write is huge because there's nothing in the middle right. but the actors. And I rewrite a lot on them. But what I was getting at more was like if you look at this book, some people give you an interview and you know it's bullshit. <laughs> it's fiction, you know. Um, and you keep talking to them, and in my head I'm going, that's not how it was, that didn't work out that way, you know, you treated me like shit and now you're saying I'm brilliant, or whatever. You know, so I think in, in some forms of nonfiction, fiction is, is operating, and also my, my recollection in putting this together is not a, can't possibly be totally objective, do you know, so, uh, and we are now working on something which we're not going to tell you exactly what it is, but we are interviewing people, and this woman is a genius at interviewing people. I don't know, don't watch 60 Minutes, to go to this, whatever Anna does, but you have this way of, of going like this and this and this and this, and then you find that middle thing that is what you talk about. But um, I think when we take these things and put them together, we're going to do it so it'll have dr dramatic uh, impact. You know, you don't want to go to a, it's not a documentary. And, um, and in a way, I feel like we're, we're using reality, but there's a fictional element, and maybe this is kind of bullshit, but to the creation of what it is. Um, and that's Well, because you have a point of view. That's number one. Right. Right? Well, yeah, it's interesting because it's what I, I just brought it up. I was just thinking about it. I don't have any answers to it, but even when you read nonfiction books, somebody is picking out what Absolutely. they want you to put together and make the story. So, and making a story is, is storytelling and it's true in fiction and nonfiction. And so when you're making your choices of what to put forth, I just think there's an interception there that goes yeah, between that. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, when, when the, the play that I told you that didn't go well, that, you know, the actors didn't like, was this play called House Arrest, where I interviewed, uh, I traveled with President Clinton in the 96 campaign, his second campaign, and also with Bob Dole, and I, and I was with the press corps. And I remember this one interview, where I was with Newsweek, and they were interviewing um, Jesse Jackson. And it was very interesting for me to watch how different political figures would try to handle the press, you know, how they, because mm. the press have that, their story. And it was so fabulous. At one point, Jesse Jackson just said to this crowd of big shot Newsweek people at the time, they were big shots. He said, oh man, now y'all just writing a novel. <laughs> and it was just, I thought it was so great. Like their question, whatever, because, and when you sit with people like the press, and you, you, you watch them, you know, you watch 60 Minutes or whatever, um, or, you know, Jimmy Fallon, whatever. You watch them making the story, your story. Right. Right. So in that way. But I think it's still different than fiction. Well, it's, it, it is different than fiction. I just meant there's an element, there can be an element of fiction. Based. Of not, nothing's really real. Well, right? everything's subjective. Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't really want to go down this path, but I'll just say it anyway. <laughs> 
you know, Will Smith. I mean, at a certain point, if you read all the stuff about it, mm. it all, almost makes you, like, at a certain point, it's almost like a burlesque or something. Mm. There's so many different ways that people saw it and what it means to them. Right. 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 Well, that's true. That's true. Um, what do you hope this book is going to do? Maybe you said that well, already. Well, I hope that it helps young people who are interested in making something, you know, because I think the lessons I learned from dealing with people, frankly, I think I didn't have any experience with, and I would have appreciated a book about that. And then collaboration, which we're doing, I think um, is also a very complicated thing. What makes it work and what doesn't? Well chemistry. I think I've worked with people that I'm, we can become of one mind, and I've worked with people that it's always this, and they're there, and, and we can't get there. So, and I think um, that's a delicate thing. They're relationships, you know, and, and I think that's delicate. And with Sondheim, you know, by the second show, the first show, I, he was kind of the god, and I was kind of, you know, but the second one, I was realized I, I know as much as this guy knows, you know, <laughs> you know, and we were we were on a much more even keel in an interesting way. How did you solve disputes? Uh, he, I think I told you this. He always said, "Whoever cares most wins." I know. Wins. That's what I was hoping you would we'd, say that. We'd argue great. it. We'd talk. We'd talk. We'd talk. And by going back and forth and back and forth, you'd realize, "Oh, this is really important to him," or "This is really important to me." And the nice thing about theater is nothing is set, so you try your way if it seems to be the more passionate one. Sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong. Um, but you just have to keep your ego out of it. Well, how do you do that? Why do you do that? How do you do that? Therapy. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Um, well, there's also the opposite side of that, which is, oh, okay, if it goes wrong, it's his fault, not mine. So, you know, it kind of goes both ways. So, um, I don't know, how do you stay married? How do you have a relationship? How do you do anything? Oh, we have our first walkouts. Oh, no. uh, maybe we should open it up to questions. Yeah, I just want to say one thing. We do have somebody else, something else in common, Anne Hold Ward. Oh, yes, yes, a costume designer. Great co costume work. designer. Yeah. yeah. Well, how are we going to work together? How's it going so far? I haven't walked out. <laughs> no, I think it's... I, I, I'm, Thrilled. I'm thrilled. Um, we're working on something that um, is challenging and complicated and possibly incendiary, which is always good. And, and um, I think we complement each other. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Yep. It'll be great. Um, does anybody have any questions? Oh, we have a yeah, microphone so, for um, you. If you have a question, you can join Grace down the middle of the aisle, and you can just form a line um, up the aisle from the microphone. Make sure you speak directly into the microphone so our friends on Zoom can hear. Um, and to our friends on Zoom, you can put your questions into our virtual Q&A. Yeah, and if you, don't, my if you don't get in line, we're going to call on you. Four of my wonderful students, five of my wonderful students are here. Oh, they Maybe are. six of them, yes, hey. in the, that row right there. We just finished, I told you, on Sunday. I want to hear how it went. And, oh. uh, you know, I had to give up one of our Saturdays to work with them I on know, Saturday. I know, I know. And I hope, you know, at least they have questions. I mean, I hope somebody has questions. Uh-oh. They must. Well, why are you here? That's my question to you. <laughs> Curious to know, first of all, bless any of you who read books, which is fantastic. Thank you. And also are interested enough to come meet with authors. It's a great thing. And here, you have someone. Hi. Hi. What's your uh, name? Uh, my name is Martha. Hey, Martha. Martha Southgate. And it's um, great to meet both of you. I actually saw, so I think it was um, Twilight at the Public Theater like way uh, when you first did it, it was incredible. Yeah, did you do it at the public or? Uh, well, what? the Twilight Los Angeles was first at the Mark Taper Forum. Oh no, 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 I'm wrong, I'm wrong, it's the other one. Um, Fires, Fires in the and the mirror. mirror. Fires and Mirror, it was incredible. The public yeah. theater was the first place for that. Yes, I saw it there, it was wonderful. And um, I guess I just wanted to say, you mentioned going back to people um, who you had a lot of conflicts with, particularly Mandy Patinkin, who I, is someone I admire a great deal, but. 
I can see is a challenge to work with. And I wonder if you could say a little bit more about, you know, with both of you having perspective, some of it is apparent in the book, but if you'd say a little bit more about, you know, how he reacted when he called him up, how that was to work through that, because that was yeah. clearly a really complicated relationship. Yeah, I mean, what became very interesting is I worked a lot with him afterwards, despite oh. the kind of conflicts we had. Um, I uh, was young, and it's hard uh, to work with other y young people because, you know, when I walk in a room now, I'm ain't the oldest guy in the room, and everybody's like, whatever you want, whatever you want, you know, because they think, because I'm old, I know better. You know, I could be senile for all they know. But, uh, but at that point in time, I had no Broadway credits. I had none of, none of the... Uh, background to inspire a lot of confidence. And um, I think we ended up becoming very close friends and he wanted to work on everything I did and he learned to trust me and understand what I was doing. And a lot, a lot of the book is about that. Uh, there's a lot of that him coming and, and him also saying to me, I think you were distorting what the situation was, which he may be right from his point of view. But he quit once. He walked out the door. I had to chase him down the street. And mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't beg him. I don't beg. I learned that. I learned that when one of the first shows I did, I had a kind of semi-movie star in it, and he quit. And, and all I did was try to keep him to do the show. You know, I didn't want him to quit. And then... I went out to dinner with my producers, and, and I th thought, well, he's going to bring people into the theater and whatnot. And they said, why do you want to work with somebody who doesn't want to work with you? Wow. And I thought, that's OK if he leaves? And they said, yeah. I mean, he doesn't want to be there. Why are you spending all of this time and energy trying? He was even younger than I was, so he left, and it all turned out fine. So you know, you learn as you go along a little bit about how to traverse different challenges that come along the way, I think. Uh, and then you become the person you become in life, I think, by the accumulation of the experiences you have. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a little loosey-goosey. Yeah, anyway. Also, I have to leave early, but it's nothing personal. This has been great. <laughs> <laughs> I, have to, I, I have a point on. So I'm leaving, but I'm not a walkout. So. That's great. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I, I probably shouldn't have said anything about those folks who walked out. but. Um, mask. Um, I'm Loretta, and I'd like to ask a question. Would it be okay if they took the mask off when you? Oh, sure. I, am I hearing a so? Yeah. Um, I'd like to ask a question, and either or both of you can answer. You both know a lot of celebrities and people who are both dead and alive, and I'd like to know if you had someone come to your house, who would you like to have sit in the kitchen with you and eat a meal with you? Who would you like to have come to the living room and socialize with? And who would you like to visit with in the bedroom to be <laughs> intimate with? <laughs> I knew it was going to get racy. I'll give it, I'll give it, We're in Brooklyn I'll give that now. to you, James. Yeah. Oh. Well, I, I, I always wish I had my parents to sit and talk to, um, mostly because I never really got to sit and talk to them ever. And by the time I did, um, uh, my mother had Alzheimer's, and um, uh, they were just of a different generation, different era, very Midwestern, small town. And if I had my fantasy of sitting down at a table and talking to somebody, it would be my parents. Who would I like in the bedroom um, to talk to, um, pillow talk? That's an interesting question. I wouldn't mind Meryl Streep. I, mean, I think she's really kind of an injury. Very, I know, I know Have you her worked very, with her? What? Have you worked with I've her? I've never worked with her, but I know her slightly. And she was actually at the Yale School of Drama when I worked there. And she was so extraordinary at whatever age she was. You just, and, it, and I just think she's um, very centered and uh, bright and smart and serious and not serious. And uh, I. I'd like, I, don't, I will never get to know her, but I would like to get to know her. So anyway, something like that. Is that okay? Is that good? What about you? You're not good? No? I don't know. I, I mean, I, I have to think about that. You know, I've talked to so many people, maybe. That's true. You know? Is there anyone that didn't talk to you that you wish had talked to you?
You know, I never interviewed. Did I, I never interviewed Obama? Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, if I started thinking about it, lots and lots of people. Uh, I I talked to. Uh, I, I didn't have the nerve to turn on my tape recorder with uh, Sidney Poitier at his mm. house, and I just felt too impolite doing that. Mm. I feel that was just bad that I didn't do that. Uh, he's a wonder. He was a wonderful talker. His stories are. Mm. He didn't know how to read when he came to this country, and you know who taught him how to read? It. He was a dishwasher, and this white dishwasher taught him how to read, reading a newspaper, in this restaurant. You know. Mm. So there's, t yeah, there's a lot of people, but I don't know. That, I think that's an excellent question. I think I'll use that the next time I do an interview. <laughs> this is Arun from my class. Oh, hi. Hello. How are you? Um, thank you for coming. Oh, thank you. Um, this is extraordinary. Um, I just wondered, um, you know, Anna was talking about the recent production of Toilet with different actors and with the work like Sunday that's been revived so many times and there's been so many different versions. For you, not just as a writer, but also as the director of the original work, what, what was your experience with those? Do you go? Do you, how involved are you? And does it change your, has a revival ever kind of changed your relationship with the work or made you examine it in it's, a different way? It's a way? really great question. I would say um, I'm often critical of the writing, but the writing in that I don't explain things as the author in the script. So the director who takes the script doesn't know what they're doing because I don't spell out what my intentions were either in a scene or a moment. And I've had to explain to people, no, this is what this is about. You know, it's not about what you're doing. It's really about this thing that's unsaid going on. And so I would say um, I learned from watching other people do it as a writer how even though I love to underwrite things, that I've got to be sometimes more articulate as a writer to let a reader or a director know the intention of the scene. Um, and directorially, you know, sometimes it's a, it's, it's a nightmare and sometimes it's uh, glorious and you see things you never saw and are better than what that you did. And so uh, Into the Woods is a perfect example. I've seen every Hmm. Possible. <laughs> I mean, you can't believe what I've seen. <laughs> you know, um, I, I went and saw a German production. Wow. The German productions are, I saw two German productions. One where the, the uh, curtain came up and the baker and the wife in the show are sitting on lawn chairs drinking beer. <laughs> and I thought, out of cans, and I didn't go, okay, let's see how this goes. And, and another one in Germany where Little Red Riding Hood was wearing, um, uh, it was really dressed as a hooker. Wow. And she had a tiny skirt and big heels and, and, and a little cape. I don't know how to put it. They liked it, so there you go. Thank you. Arun yeah. is a director, actually. What? Arun is a oh, director. Yeah. Oh, yeah. great. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Sorry. We'll talk. Yeah, please. Okay. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Mekhala. Um, I'm also one of Anna's students. Um, my question is, like you said that before you did this, you'd only done one musical with Bill Finn, which is March of the Falsettos, yet, right? What was it like to enter the world of musicals? Like, did you have experience with or training in music? What was it like to face the barriers between straight plays and musical theater? You know, I approached everything visually because that was my orientation, both in design and photography. I love music. I don't know music at all. I just respond to it emotionally. Um, the Bill Finn thing was completely sung through so I just brought the, to me, Bill Finn is this great composer, lyricist, but he's, you know, he's really kooky. And I'd, and I'd take the mess and clean it up and put it together and say, Bill, you need to do this, Bill, you need to do that, we need this, we need that, and that's how that worked. But um, I, again, I think it's just, I think visually and I think emotionally and, um, I don't do a lot of stuff, you know. I don't take a lot of jobs. Uh, I've been fortunate that way. The jobs I've taken have been in movies. 
and television to make my living because you can't, sorry to tell you, make it in the theater. And, um, and I try to ask myself, why am I doing this? And continue, I usually, when I start to write something, I, I write a sentence down and put it on my desk to keep reminding me of why I'm writing what I'm writing. And then I ask myself, what I'm writing here, does it answer that question, you know? Or is it about that issue? Or is it about this thing I care about? And that's what kind of guides me. And it's usually what's going on in my head at the time, so kind of like that. I wonder if there is something about a visual imagination and the space that it creates. I mean, after all, this is a picture coming right. to life and into music, yeah. right? You know? No, I think it's, yeah. I mean, and that's why I direct, because I like, I have the imagery, and when I'm writing it, I'm seeing it. Um, I don't know. Some don't think that's a good idea, but I don't care. That's how I like to do it. So. Oh, hi, hello. My name is Rachel. I'm also uh, one of Anna's students. Um, my question Beautiful singer. Oh. <laughs> oh, nice. And her whole, um, uh, she made a, one, a brief one-person show about writing a song. Oh, nice. Which is, <laughs> yeah. I think, about the torture of facing a blank page. Yeah. Right? That we all yeah. know about. Yeah. Uh, so my question is, um, throughout your career, is there a risk that you're really glad you took and a risk that you wish you had taken? Oh, jobs I'd taken? Yeah, like or a risk you took um, in creating a show or a choice you made that you're really glad that you made that choice. Oh, there's choice, a lot of things. Or something that you're really glad you didn't there's, do. There's a few things I wish I had done mm -hmm. just because they're, I'd have a whole other life because they're so successful. <laughs> Although then my wife says to me, yeah, but if you did it, it wouldn't be, a, it would have been better, but not as successful. So <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but anyway. Uh, no, I don't regret anything. I don't regret the flops, the things that didn't work. I was, uh, I, I, you just, I just realized I can't beat myself up about it, you know? I did my best and what I try to do over time is figure out why didn't that work or what would I do if I had to do over again or, uh, you know, I, I did a movie a little while ago and I realized after we shut down, oh my God, I know what the, how I should have done this ending. But it changed the whole movie and I, too late to the to the party, so no, I don't think you can. I don't. I don't believe there's much to be gained by beating yourself up over things that you do or don't do or don't do well or you make a mistake. You just learn from it and move on. That's what I think. Do you have regrets about anything you've done? Well, I like things to work. <laughs> yeah. Well, we all like that. I like things yeah. to work and. I like people to be happy and, you know, I don't like it if people have spent their money on something of mine and it didn't work out, yeah. you know. How as an actor do you deal with working with an actor you don't like? I'm trying to think if I've had that happen of Wow, late. that's great if you didn't. You know, I think as a younger actor, I did have that happen. Oh, I did have that happen. <laughs> um, She's blocked it. Yeah. yeah, I've blocked it. It's funny, he did something to me that was really not good. And, but the, the extraordinary thing about it was all the men in the cast sat down with me and would not leave the theater until I agreed to report him. And this was before, wow. this was before we did that. And then the equity person told me, if I were, after that, after all the, it was really powerful, all yeah. these guys, you know, sat down with me at, the, at this theater in LA. They had this great big lobby and they were just yeah. like, sis, you have got to, you know, even Roscoe Lee Brown, I mean these, and, so and then great. I went to the equity person and they said, I'd actually not say anything about it if I were you. But what I remember is all those guys mm. saying, you gotta, you gotta turn him in. And um, so I didn't enjoy that individual, yeah. but this, this, I'm not to, to, to underplay the seriousness of him, but I, it was a powerful experience to have those men uh, be as upset about it as I was, you know. That's a good group of men. But I've been very lucky in terms of, to the extent that I am in things that are with other people, you know. Uh, it doesn't get better than Martin Sheen, I tell you that right now mm -hmm. as a human being. You know, and I've had a chance to work with wonderful, wonderful actors and wonderful writers in terms of mm. my film and television career. Yeah, I haven't done any theater with other actors in my 
you know, the bulk of my career. Right. Mm. So, yeah. Hi. Hello. Hi, my name is Sarah. Thank you very much for this wonderful session. I have two questions. I imagine that you always have like a lot of ideas in your mind. And one, how do you like decide or like know that, oh, this is the one I'm gonna put all together to make it happen? And second, how do you know that you complete your work? <laughs> Because um, it's like... You don't know, <laughs> but you do know as you go along. I've started a lot of projects I've never finished. Mm -hmm. I haven't gotten that far along, but I'll sit down and write, and I realize I don't have a full... E now, not everything has to be a full evening, you know? It could be a 10-minute play or whatever. Um, but I've also written things I shouldn't have bothered finishing, <laughs> you know, and they're not bad, but they're not, they, they were more of a job or um, a job for myself, you know, that I'm unfortunately one of those people who likes to finish things they start, whether, and I, th I think I'm beginning to learn that I don't have to do that anymore, you know. Um, it's a pretty good question because I think it's so individual and intuitive. Um, you can't really know, what's great about the theater is I love doing readings of things I write as I'm doing them because then I begin to know whether something's working or not and what's missing. So I find that very helpful. Um, and then sometimes people just don't want to do what you wrote and that's a pretty good indicator that, <laughs> you know, if enough people say no to something, there's probably a reason. So. And how do you decide between projects to start something? What makes you start something? That's what caused you to to stick with it, but yeah, I think it's a great question. You young ideas. lady, too, had it about how do you start? When do you decide you know, that's a good idea? This is going to sound really loosey goosey. I'm really into dreams. I believe a lot in my dreams, and I have a little dream book, you know, and I feel like my inner voice comes through my dreams sometimes, and sometimes I, th I, 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 I find that I'm working it out at night when I'm asleep what I'm doing, ideas I have, and whatnot. And I think keeping an idea book is great. And uh, if you keep having the same idea or the same themes or you know, things you want to say, uh, that's a pretty good indicator that you have something to say. You know? It's hard. It's, 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 it's fun, though. You know, just, it's just paper and pen. You know? Now it's just computer. You can get rid of it. You know? Anyway, good luck. Thank you. Sure. I think it's great how many young people have turned up. I think it's great and great that older people showed up. Yeah. <laughs> but we are old. Well. And I'm happy I, that younger people want to hear from you us. You know, I feel I owe a lot to my immaturity. You, you what? My immaturity. Okay. I'm it's actually still with you? pretty immature. Okay, good. At heart. <laughs> I know. Well, I mean, theater to me is kind of play activity. A child being, it's a yeah, child's thing. kind of a little bit, no? Maybe not, maybe yes, maybe no. Hi. Hello. <laughs> um, thank you both so much for being here. My name is Hannah. Um, I guess as I've been listening to you speak, and just now what you're talking about of kind of this uh, child's play of theater, something that I think is interesting about the work that you speak about in this book, and Anna, your body of work um, is this notion of putting it together, kind of fitting these puzzle pieces together of the interviews mm. or of collaboration. Um, and I know that Stephen Sondheim was like famously a lover of puzzles and games and things like that. And I'm curious about how that kind of logical, mathematical almost side interacts with the creative artistic process for you, specifically mm. on Sunday or generally over your careers. Mm. I think this is a great question for you because, <laughs> well, you know, because even with working with you, you know, you're really a structure person. Yeah, I am kind of a structure and, person. And, you know, you kind of go, well, I see such and such, and it's like a kind of mechanical in a good way. You, you're, you're, you, I think you think about how it's going to work together early. Right. Like the structure reveals itself to me, you know, I have this mass of stuff, a mass of stuff, and then structure evolves. But you, you, you're thinking about it. It, it 
early on. And visually, and too. And visually, Because I don't yeah. want to write something I, I don't want to put on or, you right. know, or, yeah. or see. Um, you know, it's so ineffable being a writer. By the way, I don't like writing at all. I really love rewriting. So I just say throw up on a page and then cleaning up. Cleaning it up is, I'm good at cleaning up. But uh, if you, uh, other writers are different. Like some writers will write one paragraph, one page a day and keep refining it and refining it and refining it. I don't, I bang stuff out and then refine it over time just to kind of get an idea of something. Sondheim though writes music and music, it's very different when you write music and he doesn't write music like most people noodling at a piano. He wrote with, you know, uh, music sheets and chords and notes and whatnot and li his lyrics are unbelievably uh, crafted and worked and worked and worked on. So it was interesting that we were working together because we had completely different methodology and I would just bring things I tossed off in and and I think I loosened him up a little bit and I think he tightened me up a little bit and uh, we were a good team together for that reason. So um, I just think, I think what's great about theater is you can always find a room and some actors and hear what you're doing. You know, even if they're your friends and they're not even actors, you know, I think that's what I like about theater. Film, I thought I wanted to be a film director until I made my first film and then I realized <clears throat> not for me, yeah, not for me, so. Uh, I mean, I like having made a film, but I didn't enjoy the film process at all, so. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you both. Okay, thank you. Very much for this wonderful conversation. Thank you all for coming this evening. Um, we can clap. Thank you. <laughs> by the book.